Before we get started, there will be spoilers for the Thousand Year Blood War arc of Bleach in the video to follow. The Vandenreich had a thousand years to prepare for their war against the Soul Society. During that time, they gathered considerable intelligence on their enemy, their tactics, their abilities, and just about everything else, enabling them to understand and counter the Shinigami in almost every conceivable way. As part of this Dayton distributed to all Sternritter on the battlefield and a core component of his war machine to defeat the Soul Society, Yuharbark designated five Shinigami as high priority targets to be dealt with using extreme prejudice. These high priority targets were known as the five special war powers or special war potentials and were chosen because they each possessed an unpredictable element that even Yuharbark himself couldn't quantify after a thousand years of observation, and thus were considered a potential threat to the Vandenreich's chances of success if left unchecked. And the five special war powers are as follows. Urahara Kisuke, noted for his incalculable tricks, Yuhabak placed him on the list due to his incredible resourcefulness. Kisuke famously plans for every single eventuality before going into a battle, allowing him to adapt to enemy advantages and situations on the fly. This makes fighting him nearly impossible as he's already prepared himself for every outcome. Thanks to his planning and scheming, Kisuke is able to help the captains retrieve their stolen Bankai and even engineer a makeshift route to the royal palace not once, but twice, before using his incredible foresight to defeat a member of Yuhabak Schutzstoffel. And next up is Ichibe Hyosabe, the leader of the Zero Division who Yuhabak placed on the list for his wisdom. Ichibe's achievements are definitely the most nebulous overall, but considering his seemingly limitless age and power, it's not a surprise to see him on the list. And we do see the fruits of some of Ichibe's wisdom come to bear, however. For example, it's thanks to him that Renji is able to learn the true name of his Bankai, enabling him to go and kill a Sternritter and become powerful enough to stand shoulder to shoulder with some of the strongest captains. Then we have Kenpachi Zaraki, who is labelled a special war power thanks to his incredible combat prowess. Of course, we see Kenpachi's fighting ability at the forefront of the war. In the first invasion alone, he kills three Sternritter by himself. Ironically, Kenpachi is actually seemingly less effective after learning Shikai and doesn't outright kill a single enemy from that point, but he does use his newfound power to obliterate a meteor that threatened to devastate the entire battlefield and everyone in it, so that's definitely something. Eventually unshackled and let loose, Kenpachi is able to use his Bankai to challenge Yuhabak's holiest, most divine warrior at the end of the world, showcase his immense combat proficiency in full. The fourth Shinigami to be considered a threat is Sosuke Aizen, noted simply for his Reiatsu. Yuhabak even tries to recruit the imprisoned Aizen, but he refuses the Quincy King's offer. Aizen's Reiatsu has become so immeasurable, so completely unstoppable, that he threatens to blow the royal palace and presumably everyone in it, including Yuhabak, out of the sky. Even though he's unable to do so, thanks to Mayuri's intervention, Aizen does use his insurmountable spiritual pressure to rescue the Gote 13 from the equally overwhelming power of the Soul King, decimating the army of eyeball monsters that fall from the palace above. And later, Aizen is able to fight Yuhabak, even after the latter has become the new Soul King himself, and confound him successfully with Kyoka Suigetsu, thanks to his incredible power. And finally, Ichigo Kurosaki was selected for his latent potential. This one is fairly self-explanatory, and we've seen evidence of Ichigo's true, monstrous, slumbering power coming into play at unexpected times to tip the balance before throughout the entire series. In fact, Ichigo is seen as such a huge threat, he's labelled the number one special war power, and Yuhabak invades Soul Society when he does, purely because Ichigo is tied up in Waco Mundo at the time. But after unlocking his true power, Ichigo is capable of fending off eight Sternritter at once, and his hybrid nature combined with that sheer potential unlocked is enough to take on Yuhabak himself, eventually killing him twice. 
So ultimately, it's not hard to see why these five Shinigami were deemed potential threats to the Vandenreich's war effort. All five of them are immensely powerful and crucially dangerous in their own right, and they all have a material effect on the grander war itself. But were there any other characters that deserved a nod, that deserved some recognition from the Quincy King? As we see from the Thousand Year Blood War arc itself, there are other characters who pose a problem for the Vandenreich who make enough of an impact across the war to surely be a prickly thorn in their enemy's side. I've got a few potential candidates here for who I think could have been the sixth special war power. Remember, these characters, while all strong in their own right, weren't placed on the list purely for their power alone. They have to possess some kind of factor that makes them an unquantifiable threat to the Quincy's entire victory. So let's take a look at who deserved to be number six on Yuhabark's list of notable threats. First up, let's take a look at one of the most obvious choices. So obvious, in fact, that his omission from the list is actually addressed in the arc itself the former head captain Shigakuni Genryasai Yamamoto. With unmatched destructive capabilities and perhaps the single strongest Zanpakuto ever in terms of raw power, Yamamoto feels like an obvious fit. With over a millennium of history behind him, he is the most battle-hardened Shinigami in the entire Gotei 13, and we see the full force of his fury firsthand when he annihilates a Sternritter with a wave of his sword before putting down three more just as easily. So why wasn't he considered a notable threat by Yuhabak? Well, it seems like it was out of spite more than anything else. Yuhapak explains to a dying Yamamoto that he wasn't made a special war power because he never healed his missing arm. But it isn't so much the missing arm that's the problem as the reasoning behind why he never restored it. Yamamoto didn't want to involve Orohime in the Shinigami's affairs, and Yuhapak despises that perceived weakness. In the eyes of the Quincy King, the demonic founder of the Gote 13 from a thousand years ago, is long dead. This modern-day Yamamoto has grown old, complacent, and above all, kind. He's no longer the Yamamoto that defeated Yuhabak all those years ago, and now has dragged the entire Gote 13 down with him. So, despite Yamamoto clearly having the power necessary to make the list, Yuhabak refuses to grant him that honour. Instead, he's sending a message that the Gote 13 has fallen far, and Yamamoto's supposed weakness is the catalyst for its eventual destruction. Now, in terms of characters that could feasibly be the sixth special war power, firstly, we have what I think is probably the most obvious pick, the current captain of the 12th division, Mayuri Kurotsuchi. Mayuri definitely has the chops to be a notable threat and has been considered one of, if not the overall MVP of the Shinigami side by the community for a while now, despite not making Yuhabak's list. In my opinion, while Mayuri's unquantifiable factor is probably similar to Kisuke's, it's not quite the same. Mayuri would instead make the list for his scientific prowess, or possibly even just his intelligence, though Kisuke does have him beat on that front. But it's thanks to Mayuri that the Gote 13 has a stronghold to work out of during the second invasion. When all hope seems lost, and the Vandenreich replace the entirety of Seireite with their own landscape, Mayuri's light-soaked secret laboratory offers the Shinigami their one safe haven. Mayuri is able to correctly deduce that the Quincy are using the shadows to move around and reworks his entire personal lab to counter that. It's the one place the Sternritter are never able to infiltrate, and as such it becomes the headquarters for not just the 12th Division, who take complete control of the battle here, but eventually the remaining Gote 13 forces. This is a pretty big deal in itself, but Mayuri goes above and beyond. When he steps onto the battlefield, he reveals his Kurotsuchi corpse unit, having enlisted the help of some, shall we say, wayward Arankar, and even rescues Toshiro, Matsumoto, Kensei, and Rose 
from otherwise certain death, reversing their zombification. Myri even defeats a Sternritter and later a Schutzstoffel member as well, who also happens to be none other than the left arm of the Soul King. For the simple fact that Myri challenges God himself by the end of the arc, I feel like he's absolutely the front runner to be the sixth special war power, something I think would make him very happy indeed. In fact, I do wonder how he felt about Kisuke being designated a threat and not him. Myri, however, is ever present in this arc. In fact, without a doubt, the Thousand Year Blood War arc is his best showing in the series, and it really reinforces how much of an asset Myri actually is to the Soul Society. Yes, he's a morally bankrupt monster, but the Gote 13 simply can't refuse his skills. Maybe Yu Harbark thought it would be redundant to include two scientists on his list, I'm not sure but it does feel remarkably short-sighted or maybe just plain arrogant of the Quincy King to ignore so many characters, especially when they go on to achieve as much as Myrie. The next character on my list again feels like a pretty natural fit to be a special war power, and that's of course the current Captain Commander, Kyoraku Shunsui. Now, while Kyoraku absolutely has the power necessary to make the list of threats, he's here for his strategy or underhanded tactics. As the Gote 13's foremost frontline tactician and commander of their forces, Kyoraku makes the Soul Society's big plays and difficult decisions. In many ways, he is the inverse of Yamamoto, something I'm surprised Yu Harbark didn't take note of, though perhaps it was too late by then anyway. While Kyoraku isn't as powerful as Yamamoto in terms of raw strength, his mind is absolutely more dangerous and unorthodox. In fact, Kyoraku represents a new age of the Gotei 13, and it's that Gotei 13 that ultimately brings down the Vandenreich. From deciding to allow Kenpachi to unlock his true power, to freeing Aizen from prison to save them, Kyoraku's decisions have far-reaching ramifications that affect the entire war, as they should for someone in his position. As a less traditional leader than his father figure before him, Kyoraku forcibly pushes the Gotei 13 into the modern era, his devious nature enabling them to keep pace with the Vandenreich, even when it looks like the enemy is making all the right moves. Of course, Kyoraku's famous quote encapsulates his tenure as leader and how he steered the Shinigami through their most dangerous battle ever. I don't believe using evil to defeat evil is itself an evil act. This quote highlights the differences between Kyoraku and Yamamoto, and how, while Kyoraku's Gote 13 isn't cruel and bloodthirsty like the original Gote 13 of old, it is new and it is improved from the laid-back, easy-going and weak Gote that festered under Yamamoto's final years. More willing to meet the Vandenreich on their own terms. On top of all that, Kyoraku is strong enough alone to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the leader of the Schutzstoffel, forcing Lille into not one, but two transformations all by himself. This means that there aren't many Sternritter that can stand up to Kyoraku's full power. So while he might not be quite as flashy as Yamamoto, the current head captain is absolutely dangerous in his own right. Now, after Mayuri and Kyoraku, we start heading into slightly murkier waters, though I have to admit, I like this next pick quite a lot. My next candidate for the sixth special war power is Jushiro Ukitake, who would be considered a notable threat for his divine deal. Now, this one is a little tricky, it's possible Yu Harbak doesn't even know about the existence of Mimihagi at all, and certainly not that it eventually possessed a young Jushiro however many years ago. Yes, the Vandenreich were watching the Shinigami for a thousand years, but as far as I understand it at least, the scope of their reconnaissance only reaches the edges of Seireite itself. Anything that happened in the far-flung regions of the Rukongai remains a mystery to them. It makes sense to me that if Yuhabark knew that one of the captains possessed a means to stabilise all three worlds after the Soul King had been killed, and effectively replaced the dead Rayo the moment he had been taken out, then the Quincy King would designate that captain as a high-priority target. 
especially if he was as powerful as Ukitake. While Ukitake doesn't get the chance to do much in the Thousand Year Blood War arc, he does invoke the Kamikake, enabling the right arm of the Soul King to take over his entire body, transforming him into a vessel for Reo himself. At the height of the war, with the Soul King's death causing all three worlds to converge and collapse, Ukitake steps in and is able to prevent their total destruction, simultaneously halting Yuhabark's plan much of the Quincy King's shock. Considering it seems like Yuhabark had tried to account for everything, including carving the most direct path to the Soul King as possible, Ukitake's mere existence does feel like a major oversight. Like I said, the most plausible answer to me is that Yuhabak simply didn't know about Ukitake playing host to Mimihagi for all these years. If he did, I think he would have tried to kill him much earlier on. Ultimately, Ukitake's sacrifice doesn't amount to too much, but it does momentarily save all three worlds long enough for Yuhabak to change his mind about destroying them in that moment buying the Gote 13 crucial time. As I mentioned, I like this one. It affords Ukitake even more importance in the grand scheme of the battle. Conversely, the next candidate is perhaps the most unlikely of all, because it would require Kubo to actually care about the Vizards. But, well, it's the Vizards as a faction, or as they'd be known by the Vandenreich, most likely the Hollow-Fied Shinigami. We've seen it already. Ichigo having Hollow Reiatsu presented the Sternritter with a major problem, as they couldn't steal his Bankai during the earliest days of the war. The same, then, must surely go for the other Vizar too, and so they would collectively make the list of threats for their Hollowfication. While the Vizards are famously useless in the Thousand Year Blood War arc altogether, on paper, they should be a real threat to the Quincy. Captain level Shinigami, whose Bankai presumably can't be stolen, wielding Hollow Reiatsu is something you would think Yuhabark would pay attention to. There are some potential reasons why they weren't included as special war powers, however. For one, the impact of their holofication on the war is quantifiable. Yuhabark and the Vandenreich as a whole must surely know what kind of an effect Holo Reatsu has on them and their soldiers, therefore making it easier to formulate a strategy to take on the Vizard captains in battle. Also, the overall impact of holofication on the Vandenreich's war machine simply isn't that great. Maybe the Vizard take out a few Sternritter here and there thanks to their powers, but at the end of the day, they're simply too small a contingent to really matter in the grand scheme of things. Of course, none of it matters anyway, because Kubo refuses to let the Vizard do anything of note. Maybe if there was an instance of the Vizard captains coming up with a strategy wherein they spread Hollow Reatsu like a virus through the ranks of the Soldat, you might be onto something. But they don't even use their Hollow Masks in battle, so there's really not a lot to go on. And so my final option falls into a somewhat similar camp as the Vizards, but I think there's enough of a difference to warrant discussing it all the same. My final candidate to make the list of notable threats at number six is none other than the former Sixth Espada, Gurimajo, the only non-Shinigami character to make the list. Gurimajo is a very interesting variable in the Thousand Year Blood War arc. Being a hollow, he's of course deadly to the Quincy, but he only pops up every now and then, yet when he does, it's often fatal. Now, while you might think Harabel fits the bill a little better here if we were going to pick an Aranka being the de facto leader of an entire realm, Grimajor is completely unquantifiable. He's a renegade, a rogue, roaming free and totally unchecked. Yuhabak makes the smart decision to take Harabel down immediately, but Grimajo is nowhere to be found, and so this extremely powerful Aranka slips through the net. Grimajo would be selected for his primal nature, or more simply, his hollow Reiatsu, but I love the idea of this wild beast of a man savaging the Vandenreich and their operations from the shadows. It would be exactly the sort of element that they simply can't control. We see it early in the war, 
when Grimajor kills Kirge Opie with a surprise attack from behind, helping Kisuke to dismantle the Vandenreich's control over Waco Mundo. And of course, much later on, where again, Grimajor kills Askin with a surprise attack from behind, helping Kisuke to bring down his enemy. Sure, Gurimajor is only taking out Sternritter with surprise attacks, but it's proof that this huge empire really should be watching its back. Gurimajor is antithetical to everything the Vandenreich think they are. Their order, he's chaos. They're refined, he's a monster. It's possible Yuhabak would never give an Arankar the honour of making the list, since he considers them lesser beings in general, but still there's no denying that Grimjo is a rogue element thrown into play on the wider battlefield. What makes Grimjo different from the Vizard is that he isn't held back by any ethical quandaries like they seem to be. As a result, he's an effective Sternritter killer. Kisuke even notes that Grimjo's transformed Rayatsu, that of an Arankar, into a full hollow upon Resurrection, was useful in battle, and he was right. So, those are some of my picks for who a potential sixth special war power could be. Mayuri, Kyoraku, Ukitake, the Vizard, and Grimjo. It's an eclectic bunch, and while I think Mayuri and Kyoraku are definitely the most clear-cut candidates, there's something to be said about the others too. Maybe if Yuhabar had expanded the scope of those he deemed threatening to him and his plans, he might not have lost in the end. But that's it for the video, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. As always, let me know what you think of my picks down in the comments below. Is there somebody I missed? There's a decent chance there is, but I think I got all of the major ones. These seem like the most likely candidates to be noted as a special war power, but of course, I would love to hear your thoughts, as always, down in the comments below. Before we go, as always, I want to say a massive thank you and give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. I really do appreciate each and every one of you so very much. If you really enjoy what I do here on the channel and you want to take your support from me another step further, you can go and support me over on Patreon as well to get your names in the credits like these and to get every single video completely ad-free. But that's it from me guys, again I really hope you enjoyed the video and until next time I'll catch you later and I'll see you then.